Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. I'm your host, David Tear, and this is my fifth video in a series on uh, the Millennium Prize problems. I think you guys all know there's seven Millennium Prize problems, uh, uh, one of which was already solved in 2002, uh, namely the Poincaré conjecture that was solved um, by uh, kind of an eccentric Russian mathematician, Grigory Perlman, who turned down the prize. But there's uh, six remaining, uh, each of which uh, um, um, involves a million-dollar reward for whoever can solve any of them, including this one, the Yang Mills existence and mass gap problem. So let's begin. So what is this problem, and why is it important? Well, the statement of the problem this is going to sound really ugly. I'll explain this as, uh, as I go on. But uh, here's the statement of the problem. So the problem is to prove that for any compact simple gauge group G, a non-trivial uh, quantum Yang-Mills theory exists in Minkowski space-time that's uh, uh, manifold, uh, Euclidean manifold with three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. I think it's topologically equivalent to R4. People sometimes write this as R to the fourth, which is really just uh, you know, the real numbers in four dimensions, if you like. You can think of three space dimensions and one time dimension. Um, anyway, so there exists a theory uh, uh, in Minkowski space-time um, uh, that has uh, um, a mass gap greater than zero. We call it mass gap delta. So that's what we're trying to prove, that a Yang-Mills theory exists. And so you have to kind of know what a Yang-Mills theory is first, and it also exists with a mass. So that's the statement of the problem. And that's a mouthful. And uh, that probably didn't make sense to most of you guys. It just barely makes sense to me. But in more lay per, uh, per people's terms, what it's really saying is that, um, you know, the, there's, a, there's a theory in the standard model. The standard model is kind of the model that all um, uh, particle physicists use these days in, uh, in um, you know, studying and describing all, all particle interactions, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it works pretty well. I mean, it's an ugly theory, and it involves kind of three theories all kind of tied together. It involves the uh, electromagnetic, you know, quantum electrodynamics. I'll get into this later, but that was the theory that uh, Feynman uh, came up with in the 1940s, uh, as well as uh, Julian Schwinger and uh, um, Yushi Tomonaga, you know, uh, concerning the... Uh, interactions, uh, electromagnetic interactions of elementary particles. Uh, um, and then there's also uh, the other things that go into the standard model or uh, the um, uh, theory of the weak interaction, which was first uh, um, described by uh, Enrico Fermi, I believe, in the 1930s, and, and then finally unified uh, during the 1960s and 1970s by three... Uh, uh, particle physicists, uh, uh, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg, they all came up with this theory called the electroweak theory that then ended up unifying electromagnetism with a weak uh, interaction. And uh, the last thing that needs to be unified is a strong, the theory of the strong nuclear force. So there's four sort of known forces in the universe. There's three that govern particle interactions. There's uh, the electromagnetic force that also governs large things. Uh, that's why we have electricity and magnetism uh, on a macroscopic scale. And then, but it also affects particles. I mean, all the forces involve particles, but the ones that are most obvious are the electromagnetic force. Uh, and then there's also two nuclear forces that were both discovered, I think, in the 1930s. There's the uh, strong nuclear force, which is the force that binds uh, protons and neutrons together inside the nucleus of atoms. That's the force that's released during a nuclear explosion. It's also the force that's released by, by nuclear power plants. It's how we get nuclear energy. So that's a very important force, and obviously it's a strong force. Involves a lot of energy. And there's also the weak nuclear force, which is the force governing radioactive decay. Um, and, um, you know, like the name suggests, it's a much weaker force than the strong force. And, uh, you know, this was first studied in the 1930s as well, um, like I said, by Enrico Fermi, but then Glass, Echelon, and Weinberg figured out how to, how to 
you know, unify it along with electricity and magnetism. So really sort of two aspects of the same force. And it'd be nice to also unify the strong force. And I should mention the Yang-Mills theory. Yang-Mills theory is the theory of the strong force, strong nuclear force. It was developed by these two physicists, uh, Yang and Mills in the 1950s, I think 1953. And, um, you know, um, physicists trying to unify that as well. And one way to do that would be to prove that the, you solve this problem, the Yang-Mills uh, um, existence and mass gap. So, um, you know, um, that would be a really nice thing to do, but nobody really knows how to do it yet. And, uh, you know, I guess I already gave you a lot of this background. I don't even know if I have to keep going through this. Uh, like I said, I'm kind of a novice on this stuff myself. I never really studied Yang-Mills theory. I think I told you just about all I know about it. You know, it's, a, it's an ugly theory. I've, I've read books about this theory. It involves some very, very difficult math. I mean, all this particle physics is just, most of it's way over my head. I mean, you know, if you want to know the truth, I got sick during the 1980s. I got, I got mentally ill trying to learn string theory. Uh, I don't want to get into this too much, but I had a nervous breakdown in 1989. I think part of the reason for that was I was trying to learn string theory. I wanted to try to discover the unified field theory. I failed miserably. I didn't get very far with it at all. I also had a lot of personal issues. So I got very depressed and I ended up having a nervous breakdown being hospitalized for a month. And uh, ever since I've been laying off uh, high energy physics, this is too much for me. So I'm not gonna try to solve this problem. Um, I've done as much work on elementary particle physics as I'm ever going to do in my life. But anyone else who's interested, uh, there is a million dollar prize in solving this problem. And uh, it's not, it's, in, another reason why this is really interesting is because it's a step in the direction of what's known as the holy grail of physics, the theory of everything. I mean, the only thing left out by this theory would be gravity. See, gravity, there, there's kind of two big theories of the universe. I mean, this really fascinates me, but nobody's figured out how to unify these two major theories in physics. There's there's uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which he, he developed, fully developed in 1915. It's basically the modern theory of gravity. Uh, it involves really big things, you know, like stars and, and galaxies and uh, planets. You know, it, it describes gravity. But it describes gravity in terms of curvature of space and time. That's what that was Einstein's genius. He figured out how to how to kind of come up with a geometric theory of gravity, and he succeeded really really well. But then there's another theory that governs really small things. That's called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics uh, kind of tells you how particles behave or how things behave on the atomic scale. And things behave very counterintuitively. I mean, you have things like the uncertainty principle, and then you have wave particle duality, and just about everything in quantum mechanics seems to defy common sense uh, reasoning. You know, things can be either waves or particles, depending on how, how, how you observe them. You know, we have uh, complex valued quantities. You know, we have uh, measurable and unmeasurable quantities. We have fundamental limits on on, uh, you know, how accurately we can measure things. Uh, and people even, uh, you know, some, some physicists and some also some crap pots as well have thought maybe there's a connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness. I kind of think there is, actually. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, you know, the, the problem is that we have these two theories of the universe, but they're completely, as far as we can tell, as far as anybody's been able to do anything with. Nobody has figured out how to unify these two theories. And we kind of have to because, because uh, you know, the, the, I mean, they both uh, involve how the universe works. And whatever, whatever laws the universe uh, obeys, it has to obey both relativity and quantum mechanics. It's just that we usually only need to use one theory or the other because we use relativity works just fine without quantum mechanics when we study big things or things that move close to the speed of light, or both. Or, but then quantum mechanics works fine if we're studying small things. So, But, you know, there has to be a theory that, that includes both of them. And nobody's been able to figure out what that theory is. That's the attempt of string theory. I think, uh, you know, I mean, standard model, we're talking about particle interactions. Most particle physicists aren't even worried about gravity. 
those who are studying things like string theory or loop quantum gravity. So this Yang-Mills existence and mass gap problem, uh, it really does not involve gravity at all. It's just it's a step. I, I would say it's a step in the direction of a grand unified theory. I mean, this is a little. I think this is kind of a bad nomenclature. There's there's the unified field theory, or I think nowadays people just call it the theory of everything. But that would be theory that includes all four forces, unifies all four forces into one force, and it's really one theory of the whole universe that it, you know in principle explains everything about the universe and. You know, you know, physicists have been looking for this for the last uh, 100 years or so. Even Einstein tried to do this. But Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics. Einstein's biggest problem, actually, I think, was that he rejected quantum mechanics. He said God does not play dice with the universe. Well, he was wrong. God does play dice. That's what quantum mechanics is all about. You know, he was a little prejudiced against, you know, his views of what God does. And even Niels Bohr commented on that. He said, stop telling God what to do. So, uh, you know, um, but, you know, um, we have to figure out how to unify these theories. And before we even do that, we kind of have to figure out how to, how to explain uh, uh, Yang-Mills theory, uh, uh, you know, mathematically. And this is very, very hard stuff. I mean... Uh, you know, not just for the reasons I mentioned, but the math involved is just it's light years ahead of what I've been able to do. I mean, uh, I don't know. But um, I, I think I've said about all I have to say, but I'm just going to say one more thing. So uh, what's the status of this problem? Well, I think that hardly any, any progress has been made. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but as far as I can tell, uh, the only kind of progress that, that I know about in, in solving the Yang Mills uh, existence and mass gap problem is that th there have been physicists who have done uh, computer models of uh, you know of the uh, I guess the Yang Mills theory or of the uh, standard model and they've actually found numerical evidence for the existence of a mass gap so it seems to be true just based on computer models but. But I think that's as far as anybody's gotten with this theory. I don't think that there's been any progress in terms of the theoretical math involved. Uh, but maybe one thing that's encouraging here is that there's also there's another theory, namely uh, uh, the Higgs theory, the, th the theory of the Higgs boson. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with this because this was big news about um, you know 2012. Uh, uh, so one of I think one of the biggest uh, recent uh, discoveries in the whole history of science. I'd say in this millennium, I can I can think of two really really break you know major breakthroughs in science in in the in this millennium. Uh, one of them was the uh, uh, discovery of uh, of gravity waves by LIGO. Uh, we discovered the first gravity wave, first experimental evidence in 2015. Not only that, but we discovered uh, we experimentally verified that black holes really do exist. Because we found two black holes that coalesced and produced these huge gravity waves that they, we were able to detect. That was a very major discovery. The other really major discovery, this just happened a few years before that. This is one that most physicists accepted, expected, though. This was the discovery of the Higgs boson. And here's a picture of it on the bottom of this slide. This is a, a picture of what the particle detectors found at... Uh, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, this is in Switzerland. I guess most of the research in uh, high energy physics, at least particle physics, is being done in in uh, Europe now, in Switzerland, because uh, you know uh, part of the reason for that is because the SSC, the superconductor super collider, got scrapped in 1993 by by Congress because they didn't see the need for theoretical particle physics research. They didn't want to spend taxpayers money on looking for uh for um, you know high energy particles which i think was a really really big mistake you know we'd rather spend it on weapons i guess but but um anyway they did this in europe i mean this seems to be the new mecca of uh, knowledge in the world now america's going down the tubes in terms of education as i'm sure you all know but they're doing things pretty well in europe and uh, one thing they're doing really well is uh, particle physics. They they discovered this Higgs boson in 2012, and uh, um, and Peter Higgs he he actually 
He was a theoretical physicist who, who predicted the existence of the Higgs boson back in 1964, almost 50 years before it was actually discovered. He was there when they discovered it, by the way, and he was very happy to see his theory being vindicated, as I'm sure you can all imagine. But, uh, but what, what's really interesting about this Higgs particle, I don't know the details very well. Like I said, my knowledge of particle physics is pretty limited. But one thing I do know, and I used to hear this a lot, was that this Higgs mechanism, whatever that is, the Higgs particle is responsible for this thing called the Higgs field. And somehow this Higgs field interacts with all elementary particles in the universe and gives them their mass. It's kind of the part, people even call the Higgs particle God particle. It's a name I hate. I don't think they should bring God into it, you know. Um, it's turning it into a religion. But, but the Higgs particle is uh, uh, responsible for the masses of all, all um, elementary particles in the universe with a non-zero mass, like the electron or the, uh, all the other elementary particles, quarks, gluons, uh, you name it, you know, um, uh, other leptons, um, even neutrinos. It gives them all their mass via this Higgs mechanism. So I don't know if there's a connection or not, but we do know the mechanism, the Higgs mechanism, by which elementary particles get their mass. So I don't know if there's a connection between this and the Yang-Mills uh, existence and mass gap problem. That problem is looking for a theoretical understanding of this max gap in the Yang-Mills theory, and maybe there's a connection. I don't know. Maybe some of you guys can tell me. But like I said, I'm burned out on this problem. And, uh, you know, um, anyway, uh, that, that's pretty much all I have to say about the Yang-Mills existence and mass gap problem. Uh, thank you for watching. Long live math, and um, I'll talk. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.